Um, the purpose of this session is to give you an overview of some uh, new capabilities that we've got in the platform regarding site-to-site uh, -site mobility. So we're going to have a quick kind of review of what customers do today. And then we'll take a look at some of the changes in vSphere 6 and the platform that have kind of altered some of the options that are available. There's also going to be a short demo um, included as well. So hopefully that will play OK on these screens. Uh, it did a minute ago when I tried it. Um, and then I can hang around at the end for any Q&A. Although there is a session on straight after this. So it may be that we have to do Q&A outside just in the interest of time. OK, let's start. So what have we got today in terms of options for two-site solutions? You know, this has been relatively static for a number of years in terms of choices. And you know, the choices that my customers make when they're looking at a multi-site option are dictated by a number of things. They're either going to be dictated by budget, you know, how much money have you got to spend? You know, everybody wants a zero RPO, zero RTO solution when they start out. Not everybody can see that through to the end because as they start to get prices and quotes back, then things get, there's a lot of people laughing in the audience because everybody's been there, right? Everybody says, I want zero RTO, zero RPO. And you go back to your boss and you say, there's the bill. And he says, now go away and find something cheaper. Uh, so you go away and find something cheaper. But typically, there's, there's two options in terms of how vSphere sees things. We've got, on the left there, we've got two sites that are relatively close together. Uh, we're talking kind of metro distance there, which could be you know, anything typically up to about 100, 150 kilometers. Um, we do have a customer in Germany that's managed to do a, a synchronous stretch over 350 kilometers, which is the longest I've ever seen at achievable latency. So they're doing it with 3.7 milliseconds round trip time, which I think is pretty impressive, over 350 kilometers. I mean, that's typically referred to as a stretch cluster. And a stretch cluster would be essentially treating both sites as one. So think of it like a federated HA design. Or the other option is available regardless of distance. You can choose either. Uh, here, your two sites are any distance apart, but now they can be up to geo distance apart. And obviously, once you go beyond a certain limit of distance, you're starting to look at asynchronous technologies. But with those kind of active-passive models where you're typically replicating one site to the other and one site back again, then usually we're talking about you know, a two-site scenario, a disaster recovery solution uh, based on either array replication or vSphere replication or one of the third-party products that's out there. So that would be kind of the active-passive design. You know, both designs have pros and cons. Both have valid use cases. And I never try and force customers to use one or the other because ultimately, you have to run the system. So I don't have to run it. You know, I want you to choose the system that's right for you and your operations teams that you can manage. Because with any kind of availability design, something that's simple and easy to manage and robust generally works well and serves you well. So when we look at active-active you know, use cases, you know, why do people do this? And I'm not going to go through all the bullet points, but you know, the typical use cases are the sites are close together. You're able to stretch your networks. Because remember, with an active-active design, you're going to potentially have a design where you can v-motion between the sites. So that means you're going to have to have some kind of layer 2 equivalency at the other site. You're going to have to stretch that network. The advantages for the customer is that a site failure is a very fast restart because we don't have to do any preparation at the storage layer. It's already active at the other site. And one of the most important things, typically, because this is essentially a federated HA model, is that we, or you, human beings don't have to get involved in the failover. It's automatic because it just fails over to the other side. It's a HA restart. Now, that matters a lot to some customers because typically what happens when you have a design that's geo distances apart, where you've got something like SRM involved, is that someone has to push the button. And when things go badly wrong in most organizations, what usually happens, and certainly happens inside VMware, is people have WebExes and conference calls and we discuss it for a long time, and we go round and round in circles. And every time we're going around in a circle, the clock is ticking, and nobody's yet made a decision on do we fail over or do we not fail over. So sometimes that can be an advantage, not having to make that decision. You know, you wouldn't like that decision to be made by people on an aeroplane. You know, they have failover systems. And when you all flew here or drove here, you know, we flew yesterday, they all have standby systems. We hope that they kick in automatically. We, we hope the pilots don't sit there at the front saying, shall we fail over to the other engine or not? Or what should we do? Because all the time that's happening, the plane's going down. So active-active, 
High performance, no human decision usually, instant failover. All you have to wait for is the power on. Downsides of the design, very little control, very little orchestration, because usually it's just a mass HA restart. What do you need to achieve it? So you have to have some kind of stretch solution. You know, in Duncan's session earlier, obviously one of the new options in this space is virtual SAN stretch cluster. But there are a lot of other solutions that have been out there for a long time as well. Vplex from EMC, Metro cluster from uh, NetApp, HEM from Attachee, PIA persistence from 3PAR, the list goes on. Assuming you have one of those solutions, you have to have the sites that are the right distance apart and you have to be able to tolerate the latency of the storage vendor. That latency round trip can be anywhere from five milliseconds up to about 10, depending on the vendor. So you have to check that out before you go into this kind of design. Highlighted in red there, you also have to have a stretch network. Now, you know, there's always been ways to stretch networks. Um, typically, network people don't like the word stretched and network in the same sentence uh, for lots of historical reasons. But obviously, that industry is changing. You know, there are lots of solutions out there from the networking vendors and also from VMware now where you can help you know, put in some kind of overlay network or a stretch network design to support that virtual machine traffic as it migrates. You know, so this is typically an architectural and often a political discussion that you have to have with a network team to be able to implement something like this first. Obviously, NSX can do this now uh, in 6.2 as well. So when we look at the active-passive model, and I guess you know, some people refer to this unkindly as the legacy way of doing it, you know, because it's not maybe active-active and it's not disaster avoidance and vMotion anywhere. Some people say that's the old-fashioned way of doing it. That's how we used to do it in the year 2000 or 1995. The reality is this is still a very robust way of moving data around and protecting a data center, and it's how the majority of customers still do it today. Most people are still replicating from A to B and replicating from B to A. Both sites are active, but each one is the passive standby site for the other location. You know, that is tried and tested and it's proven to work very well. And as, as I said earlier, those things usually instill a lot of confidence when you're doing a DR design. Use cases here are obviously solutions where you can tolerate a shutdown of the system. So remember that there is no, in the version 5 platform, there's no option for long distance vMotion here. Because in that version of vSphere, we didn't support it. Virtual center was the vMotion boundary. These solutions obviously can support different networks. So it doesn't matter now whether the network's different at both sites. If the network guys say, we're not doing that, it doesn't matter. Because we can either customize the guests as they come up, we can inject the IP changes. So now you have more flexibility in the kinds of networking that you can work with and also the distances that you can support. The other thing here is typically there's an orchestration framework. So you now have control over how the restart is sequenced. And if you're moving 5,000 VMs from one place to another place, you might not want them all to just start up at the same time because your applications might be very sensitive to sequencing in terms of starting up of the various layers. You know, most people's applications tend to be that way. So with these solutions, you typically have some kind of UI and something in SRM where you can actually build a recovery workflow that will perform the sequencing in the exact same way every single time. That means when the ops guys are in charge of the system and they have to fail over and push that button, they have a lot of confidence that if they push it, everything's just going to flow through end to end. What do we need to achieve that? We need two sites. It doesn't really matter now about the network because we can support either. We do need a virtual center per site now because we can't have a single point of failure. We can't have a dependency on virtual center to run the recovery workflows. So each site is independently managed. Should anything on one of the sites fail, the only thing we need to recover on the other site is access to the storage, i.e. the replicated objects, and then access to the UI at that virtual center so we can invoke the workflows. That can also be done through an API, by the way. The storage can either be array-based replication or vSphere replication. Both are supported and both can be used at the same time for different service levels. If you have different categories of service recovery, you know, have tier zero, tier one, tier two, then you can use both kinds of replication against different sets of VMs at the same time in the same recovery workflows. Now, of course, with the latest version, we can also integrate with NSX. So in NSX 6.2 with SRM 6.1, if you're using the new universal distributed logical router and switches, which span the sites, then we can hit the APIs for that in NSX Manager, and we can map the networks dynamically inside Site Recovery Manager. Why is that useful for ops teams? 
if you're in an environment where you're doing a lot of rapid provisioning, you know, you're provisioning new workloads frequently, decommissioning workloads. In the previous versions, if you had kind of traditional port groups, traditional networking, then you'd always have to go back into the SRM UI and create the network mappings. So that in the event of a recovery, SRM knew which networks to connect the VMs to at the other side. Ops guys don't like having to remember to do that all the time. If they're getting alarms and alerts from some system that says this needs to be added, this needs to be added, this needs to be added, first question they ask me is automate that. I put a VM in a certain place, you should just automate that. Can't you just detect which networks it's connected to and make the mapping for me? We can do that now in this version. But you know, one of the challenges I've had uh, over the last kind of 10 years of my career is you know, customers typically don't like solutions that are either or. You like solutions that are both or as we say in the UK, the cake and eat it solution. You want to be able to have the option for stretch storage and potentially active passive storage and potentially vSphere application, and you want it all in the same workflow, all in the same UI, and you want your ops guys to be able to manage it from that single place. People don't like it when I tell them it's either this design, one VC, two sites, or it's this design, two sites, two VCs. They say, well, can't we have just one of them that can do everything? And the answer's always been, uh, no, you can't, because that's the way it worked. Virtual center, up until recently, was the vMotion boundary, and that was it, end of story. But there was a slide at VMworld that we showed in the US where we showed a virtual machine for the first time ever magically moving between sites. Um, and I haven't got a copy of that slide, so I've drawn my own. Uh, so, so my slide, uh, that's my slide of North America. So you know, typically, you know, this is how... Um, it's always North America. We're an American company. They never show a picture of EMEA or any country in Europe with things moving around because that's, nobody knows where that is. Um, so this is my version of North America and Canada. So we have the virtual machine on there, and we have uh, our own, the only Canadian that we all know is also on there. You know? So there's only one Canadian that anybody knows, and that's Chad Sagach. Uh, that's where he lives. So the first thing that we showed in this slide is we showed the VM moving. So we showed the VM going around the US and then landing up at the opposite side of the country. Now, obviously, in America, everybody clapped at that in the keynote, because Americans like to clap at anything, usually. And in, yeah, so says, you're not American. I can tell that by the, the name on your badge. Um, what usually happens in Europe when you show the same slide is you all sit there like you are doing now, going, looking at me, going, there's no way you can move a virtual machine that far that fast. You, you, you're not like, you're lying to us. And in EMEA, we have a more advanced customer base, like, I guess, or a more quizzical nature. So the EMEA customers say to me, how did that work then? Because that VM must have been teeny tiny VM to get that fair, that fast, unless you've invented something else that you haven't told us about. So unless you've invented a new technology that can cheat the speed of light, there is no way that VM moves that distance at that speed, unless it's about 1K in size. And you're absolutely right. There is no way you can move a VM that fast. We can do cross-center vMotion now without shared storage. But obviously, if there is no hyperdrive, then you are going to have to copy the disks from one side of North America to the other. So why am I telling you this? Because obviously in distances a lot shorter than that, you know, we can start to potentially put a storage layer in place to make that PowerPoint slide not such a kind of pipe dream. So we can maybe over a metro distance or a stretch distance, maybe if we can underpin the foundation with something like a vplex or a metro cluster, maybe we can make the VM move left to right at that kind of speed. And that's possible now because in version 6 we introduced stretch storage support and non-stretch uh, storage support for vMotion. Now you have to have vSphere 6 for this, that is the caveat here, have to have virtual center 6, have to have ES6 6. If you have those in place and obviously the appropriate networking, then you can now vMotion from VC to VC with no restriction. So this means that when we go back to our original uh, diagram that we looked at at the start, the two architectures look very similar. So now we've got the cross-center vMotion layout will work with two VCs, version 6. There's all platform services controllers in there, and you're using enhanced link mode, so that's a kind of a, a detail I didn't put on the slide. And that looks very similar to the SRM design, two VCs, two sites. The only thing you're missing is you just have to add the SRM servers in there. So now when we introduce those, for the first time ever, we can plug Site Recovery Manager into any kind of storage. 
whether it's vSphere application, whether it's stretch storage, whether it's active passive array application. So now we can start to give people that cake and eat it solution. So what does this mean in terms of what we can do? So yes, we can do vSphere application over any distance. That's, we've always been able to do that. Yes, we can do array replication. So whether you're using SRDF or Snap Mirror or HUR, whatever you've got, you can have that in there as well. Now you can introduce your stretch storage layer. So maybe this is for your tier zero workloads. You're not potentially going to put all your VMs in this layer, because usually these solutions have a price attached to them per terabyte. So if somebody comes to you with a bunch of stateless virtual machines that are low priority, unless you've got big deep pockets and piles of cash, you're probably not going to put them on that bottom layer because they don't need that level of availability and you're probably never going to want to vMotion them hot across the sites. You might put those in the vSphere replication layer or the active passive array replication layer, but you can now offer a service back to the business where any kind of storage can be protected and included in the same recovery workflow, which is most important for the ops teams. So why else did customers ask for this? Well, when you look at stretch storage solutions, there's a lot of operational tools that were missing from Virtual Center. You know, those tools live inside SRM. So think of a simple example. Uh, you know, one of the first ones is Virtual Center availability. People with stretch clusters were concerned about how do we protect the Virtual Center when there's only one? Do we just let HA restart it? What do we do? In that other design, there's two, so it doesn't matter. What about operational watchdogs? What does that mean? So a simple example. You've got a VPlex. I had one in my lab until we moved offices. But I didn't distribute every device. I didn't stretch every device in the cabinet. I did about 10, and there was about 50 non-stretch ones. Now, unless I've got a very rigid provisioning process, what's to stop me making the mistake of coming back to an existing VM, thinking, I need a bit more disk space. I'll add a VMDK. I need a new VMDK for one of the databases. And I select the wrong data store from the dropdown or I, create an, I have an error in the storage profile or policy. I've now potentially got a virtual machine that has some of its data on stretched devices nicely distributed between my two sites, and I've got one disk that isn't stretched at all. Now, with a stretch cluster, I don't get any warning about that. Nobody tells me that's bad. With SRM involved, SRM now looks at that and says, oh, hang on a minute. You had a workload there that was perfectly protectable and recoverable. I could see the A and the B version of it, you've now just added that disk and there is no equivalent over there. How is that going to work when we fail over? And the answer is it doesn't. You get there and you're missing one of your disks and then you probably lose your job and then you go look for something else to do. So ops guys were nervous about that with managing stretch clusters because they might not be experts in virtualization. Their operations teams looking after lots of systems and you give them this complex stretch cluster that they think is complex to look after and they want a UI for it. They say, where's the UI? It just looks like a normal virtual center inventory. I can't see two sites. I can just see one site with hosts and data stores. What's going on here? DRS and HA are not site aware. That made them nervous. They downloaded the white paper that Duncan and I wrote, and they read about all the things that we put in there about affinity groups and should rules and must rules and when to use one and the other. So that made them nervous as well. They were also concerned about orchestration and testing. They would say to me, all right, if I've got this stretched thingamajig, and I've got 1,000 VMs, how do I move them to the other site doing that vMotion thing? Do I right-click on them one by one and say, choose destination data store and host? Or do I write some power CLI? And who does that for me? You know, and what if I want them to go across in a certain sequence? I might not want all 1,000 to go at once. I tried that ages ago on Virtual Center. didn't like it. So a lot of the tasks timed out. How can you sequence them properly for me? Can you give me a workflow to do that that's built into the front end? We can do that with SRM. We can allow them to do large-scale storage migrations and vMotions with this tool set. So what that basically gives us is a new way to do things. So now we've got an active-active site with stretch networks and stretch storage. And remember, with stretch storage, it's read-write access of both sites for the data store. And you know, if we have, what if we have a, a HA failure? Quick, three quick examples. So something fails in our site one here. Um, you know, we have, let's say, one of the hosts goes down. So we've got a little host goes red there. VM goes down, gets restarted. HA deals with that. You know, another host goes down, exactly the same thing happens. The stretch cluster and SRM don't have to get involved. That isn't a site failure. That's just a local HA failure. No difference there, irrespective of the architecture. What about if we have disaster avoidance? So now 
we've got an event coming up which has burnt our fingers in the past. We're doing a non-disruptive uh, array firmware upgrade and we knew how well that went last time or it was a non-disruptive switch upgrade and we knew that that went really well last time and the data went and went down. So we're a little bit nervous this time and we think we might move the workloads. So now we can use the recovery plan in SRM to essentially take our workloads and then shift them over to the other site. So one by one, it'll go through the list. And this could be a list, I mean, there's three here in the picture. I didn't want to draw 5,000 for you because it had been there all day and that would have been a very, very small diagram. But we can detect the storage type that they're on and we can orchestrate the migration of those and we can set dependencies between them. So now the ops guys have a nice recovery workflow in which to do large scale migrations of virtual machines with no downtime from one site to the other. What if the site goes bang? So now it's a different scenario. Now we don't get chance to do the nice V-motion because we didn't get time. The site just went down. So this is a different scenario. So now the horrible lightning cloud comes in, but we still get some benefits. So here, what we can do is we can say, ah, okay, we can still run our recovery plan, but we still get all of the sequencing, we can still control the startup, and if we want to, we can still set dependencies between the stuff that's on the stretch storage, the non-stretch storage, and either, even the vSphere replication stuff. So we can create links between all three layers of our storage in terms of the recovery workflow. If we don't want to do that and we want to keep the stretch storage stuff separate, we can have a separate recovery plan for that and keep it to one side. So that's our tier zero, our ultra quick layer. Why is it ultra quick? Well, remember that that big stretch thing at the bottom is already read-write on the target site. It means we don't have to do any expensive operations per host like rescan, mount the data store, scan the data stores, find the VMs, power them on one by one. Those steps are all missing. We just have to power them on as per the sequence. And trust me, that can save a lot of time in some customers' environments. The time it takes to rescan the storage and mount all the data stores up per host, depending on your array, can be anywhere from minutes to hours, depending on how you've set it up. So let's have a little deep dive in how we make this work. The first thing that you need is obviously you need to plug into the storage. If you've got a VPlex, you've got a HEM system, peer persistence, metro cluster, we need to be able to see it. So we use exactly the same design that we use for existing storage arrays. We simply extended the API, the storage vendors went away, they wrote a storage replication adapter, which they're familiar with because they've been writing them since 2008 for every other version of SRM, and they made those available on VMware.com. You download them, install them into your SRM server, and you're done. That's it. It then detects that storage type, it detects that it's stretched, and it can detect that if the sites are both up, then it can vMotion between them. Nice and simple. When you set that stuff up, it doesn't look any different to anything you've ever seen before. We now just consolidate all your storage into the array management pane. So in the array management pane, you see all your devices. You see where your replicated devices, synchronous, asynchronous, stretched, all appear in a nice list. So you can start to build your recovery workflows around them. When we get into how we do that, we've introduced a new component uh, called Storage Policy Protection Groups. We've advanced from three-letter acronyms now to four because it's better to have more complicated acronyms to remember. So Storage Policy Protection Groups are another way in which we're trying to change our code from being a kind of product that needs the operators to go back into it relatively quickly to try and figure out if new things have been added and deleted. And the example I used earlier is applicable here. Remember I said about network mappings? If you add new networks in, that the virtual machines are using them, you have to map them from site to site so that we know which VLANs to plug the VMs into. If it's VLAN 10 here, which one does it plug into here? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, you have to tell us. Except if you're using NSX, it does it on its own. It's the same with protection groups in SRM. Remember, we create a protection group around a set of storage objects. We say, here's a group of storage objects that contain Exchange or Oracle or the finance team's applications, and we create a logical group around them. Now, if things go in and out of that group, and by things I mean workloads, then SRM would often send an alert out to the admin team to say, what happened there? It, did it get deleted? Is it new? Do you want me to protect it? Shall I create a placeholder over there? And you have to say, yes, do that. Yes, do that. No, it's OK. It got deleted. I moved it. Now, that's a pain for the storage admin team or the ops team. 
they don't want to have to keep logging back into Site Recovery Manager every time a new workload appears just to answer a question. Because what if they don't do that for months and months and months? And then they have a failover for real. And a lot of the VMs that were there don't come over because SRM's sitting waiting for the question to be answered. That's ridiculous, right? It shouldn't be that way. So storage policy protection groups are designed so that you can create storage policies. And again, as Duncan said in his session, we're using the storage policy layer heavily now in vSphere 6. You create a storage policy protection group, and now all of those interactions as VMs come into the data stores and go out of the data stores, it's all handled dynamically. Protection is attached and removed from the workloads dynamically. So no longer do the ops teams ever have to remember to go back in and acknowledge that question. We just do it. As long as the VM is compliant with the storage policy, it will be protected dynamically in SRM. And you have to use this type um, in SRM 6.1 for stretch storage. So a lot of this information is for reference. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through it all. But essentially, you create the storage policy protection group um, around your new storage devices. Once you've done that and you set those up, you create uh, recovery plans for them in exactly the same way that you would. We do have a new recovery plan type in 6.1 that allows you to leverage these new dynamic groups. Um, it would have been nice if we could have combined them into a single thing, but in the, in, uh, in the when we looked at the code, the only way to do that properly was to actually keep them separate. So you have two types now. You have one for the new dynamic type, and then we're still supporting the old type. You can, if you want to, if you've got existing active passive array replication, and you think, ah, I quite like that new SPPG thing, because it means I don't have to come in and answer that damn question every time a VM appears in the data store. You can delete your existing data store groups in SRM and recreate them using that new type, and that's supported as well. So you can have all of your external array protection dynamic now, whether it's stretched or non-stretched, which I think is quite good. The other thing we can do is we can now potentially support test failover. I say potentially support test failover. I mean, obviously, test failover has been there forever in SRM. We've had it since version one. This is the idea that you take a subset of your data center or the whole site, you run a recovery test, we create a snapshot of the storage, and we spin it up on the other side, and we put the virtual machines into a, a network with no uplinks so you can do a test. You can see if the data is there. You can see if the VM is working, your scripts are working, whatever it is you've built into that plan check that it looks OK. You've never been able to do that for stretch storage, typically, because stretch storage architectures are built in such a way that for the storage vendor to do a snapshot on it has always been a bit of an engineering challenge, because they're kind of storage virtualizing that disk one level higher than it was already away from the SCSI stack. So most of the storage vendors have now found a solution to that. And if they haven't, it's coming out shortly. So if they have found that solution, and it's already one of our supported options for this model, it means for the first time ever, you'll be able to do a snapshot of your stretched storage devices as well. Why do ops teams like that? Because if you have a stretched cluster, once it's live, it's live. If your POC was inadequate, your testing was inadequate, and you didn't pull the right cables and perform the right failover tests, you're not going to get to find that out until it fails for real. Because nobody's going to let you pull the cables out the back of a VPlex while it's in production. Uh, or no one's going to let you kick the power out of one of the controllers in your metro cluster just to see what happens. So testing with a stretch cluster is typically, you know, you do it at the start. After that, yeah, you can do your vMotion to see if it works, but it doesn't let you test any hardware failures or components. We'll obviously let the VMs take part of the test. If you happen to be using one of the stretch technologies that doesn't support snapshotting, then obviously we won't vMotion the live VM into the test bubble. That would be very unpopular. Um, you know, if we suddenly took your Oracle database from your live production site and went, oh, just give us it a minute. We just want to borrow it for this test and moved it into a non-rootable you know, non network. Um, yeah, you'd probably want your money back for the solution. So what we do in that situation is we say, right, we can't bring that VM over. The array doesn't support snapshot. But we can perform some checks. We can perform some checks to make sure that the vMotion would have succeeded or the restart would have succeeded had we had the chance to do the snapshot. The other thing that we could do is obviously plan migration. So I showed you a little animation of that earlier. I'll show you that in the demo in a second. So again, remember, we detect the storage as vMotionable. We vMotion the VMs over in the sequence that the ops teams want. If for some reason they want the vMotion to not happen and they want the VMs to actually be powered off and on, they can do that. You know? We've been around long enough to know that customers ask for weird things. You might think, why would anybody want to have a situation where they don't vMotion them if they can? Trust me, if we hadn't put that tick box in, it'd be the first thing that somebody asked for. So it was easier just to put the tick box in and say, look, if you want to say power that one off, that's fine. Go for it. 
in terms of unplanned failover, all of the same capabilities are available now to stretch VMs as they are to any other kind of VMs. So you can either customize the OS for things like IP stack, you can add in scripts inside the guest OS via the VIX API and let us power them on for you. So all of the same kind of callouts and bespoke customization that you've been able to do with existing workloads in SRM, you can now apply those to the VMs that live on your VPlex or your Metro cluster or anything else. So they're not excluded from that. They can still take part in all of those add-on benefits. In terms of reprotect and fail back, we deal with that as well. So again, still gives the ops team a 360 degree workflow to move stuff from A to B and back again without leaving that console, irrespective of the storage underneath. And that's what the ops teams like about this. They now feel that they've got a dashboard, if you like, where they can control complete data center migration, irrespective of the storage that you plug in underneath. We'll take care of the failback of the vSphere replication layer, active passive array replication layer, and obviously for the stretch storage, when the primary site comes back up and everything is back in sync, then we can vMotion those VMs back over to the other site. But just like normal best practice, do a test failover first to make sure it works. <coughs> 